Okay, welcome everyone to this session on the need for a coalition of women in journalism. Uh, this is a session in which, can you all hear me okay? Uh, this is a session in which we're going to discuss the need for solidarity amongst women journalists. We're going to talk about the importance of mentorship uh, among female journalists around the world, uh, particularly across borders. Uh, and I'm going to start by doing something that any uh, mentorship system designed to cater to women will tell you not to do, uh, it was something that women are told we do too much, uh, but I'm afraid I have to start by apologizing for myself uh, because I am standing in today for Kiran Nazish, who is the founder of the Coalition for Women in Journalism. Uh, I'm Megan Clement, I'm a member of the Coalition for Women in Journalism and I am the managing editor of Women's Advancement Deeply. We are an independent news platform that covers efforts to secure economic equality for women worldwide. Uh, and I am joined by Ants Busma, a freelance journalist based in Istanbul, also a member of the Coalition. Uh, but I do need to apologize that we don't have uh, our very inspirational founder, Kiran, with us today. We're going to do our best to represent her and her incredible work uh, as head of this remarkable network of global women journalists. So I want to start by just sketching out some developments which um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are already very familiar with that are coming together uh, that really allowed us to see the need for a coalition of women journalists. Um, so the first is that there are more women than ever in this profession. Uh, in past decades, we've seen more and more women coming in through journalism schools into early career positions as journalists in new parts of the world uh, and particularly in foreign reporting roles. This has been very exciting, but of course this is happening at a time when our industry has never been more precarious and fragmented, uh, which I think has real implications for the safety, security, uh, and um, long-term viability of our careers as women journalists. Uh, and then the third development, though, that has happened just in the past nine months is the rise of Me Too. Uh, I must say, as somebody who ha whose beat is women, 100%, that's all I do, uh, this has been a remarkable time uh, where the world is having conversations that specialist reporters like me have just been having in much smaller uh, venues. And the fact that we have a whole stream of... Um, of events here at uh, the International Journalism Festival, us two, uh, it's an honor to be part of that and it's a delight to see this conversation happening so widely. This has really sparked a discussion about women in, women's place in the newsroom, uh, discrimination in the newsroom and women's safety in the newsroom. Uh, but when we look at foreign reporting, international reporting and international freelancers, I think there's a really valid question that, that is raised, what happens when the whole world is your newsroom? Uh, what if you're not in an office with a predatory boss or what if you don't have an HR department? Uh, that's when we need to have these conversations that we're having today, all about solidarity and all about what we can do to support each other as women journalists. And women journalists really face a lot of the same problems uh, and challenges that women in any, any industry face, um, direct discrimination, the gender pay gap, the motherhood penalty, unforgiving care policies, uh, harassment on the job. I could go on and on and on. It is literally my job to go on about this. Uh, I won't. Uh, but I think as the industry becomes more and more fragmented, these career issues are becoming more and more acute. Uh, when there are fewer options for, for us to switch between jobs, switch between assignments, we are often in much more vulnerable situations. Uh, and often, uh, it's hard for us to see the way out. I think the nature of particularly um, foreign reporting has meant that these networks have been hard to build uh, across borders. And we're seeing with a lot of freelancers uh, that support from editors in major centers, like me, guilty, uh, is minimal, can be minimal. And I, one of one things I really want to explore in this session today, and I hope you'll join me in it, is how editors can do more to support women journalists in the field. Uh, and with also the pressure to deliver no matter what the cost, intense competition, um, there is a real need for uh, a network of solidarity uh, across borders among women. So, 
With all that in mind, uh, let me introduce the Coalition for Women in Journalism. It was founded in March 2017, and it's the first not-for-profit to offer mentorship to women journalists from many countries around the world. It's really a cross-border endeavor, and I think this is why I find it uh, such an exciting thing to be a part of. Uh, I've worked in a few countries, uh, and in, in, in those countries, in the UK, for example, there are great organizations that support women journalists in the UK. Uh, it's the same in many other countries. This is really one of the first organizations that I've come across that works across borders and reflects the international nature of much of our jobs these days. Uh, so far, we've had 50 people go through the mentorship program uh, in the US, India, Pakistan, Mexico, Turkey, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Iraq, and Brazil, uh, and many more as, as we go on. And uh, for Kieran, this was really, uh, this network was designed to fix a very particular problem. Um, there's all different types of mentorships for all different types of uh, issues at many different types of um, stages of people's careers. The Coalition for Women in Journalism addresses the issue of what happens when you've been in the industry for four, five, six years, you're in your mid-career. What Kieran found and what I hear a lot from my peers is there is a point at which you just kind of get a bit stuck. And it's hard to see what the next step is in your career or you are in a situation that is not comfortable and the nature of the business means it's hard to know where to go next. Uh, this is often when we start losing women journalists. And despite the many, many ranks of us in early career positions in newsrooms, uh, the vast numbers of young freelance journalists around the world, everywhere you look, senior journalism positions are held by men. They are held by white men. Uh, and that is not changing anywhere near as fast as it should be uh, because I think we're often seeing women when they get to their mid-career hitting career obstacles and not really having many places to turn to. Uh, so this coalition is, while open to um, helping everyone, uh, and Kieran was very uh, adamant to me that the, the coalition really is just a, a global network that, that wants to support the profession and women in this profession, it is targeted at uh, women in their mid-career. Um, and we're going to hear a little bit more about how that works. I asked Kieran to share with me uh, some of the problems that uh, fellows have brought up. Uh, as needing help with in mentorship. Uh, and it's a long list, and it's a very, um, I think, reflective of a lot of the problems that I hear a lot about from my colleagues and peers, um, just from having been in this business. Uh, it's everything from PTSD in the field, stress issues, harassment, instability of freelance careers, feeling lost and unsure of how to advance to the next stage of the career, skill development, dis discrimination, abuse, it's the whole spectrum. Uh, and the idea of the program is to pair up mentors and fellows to work on one particular issue over a period of months to try and A, keep women doing this job that we need women doing, uh, and B, help them tr um, advance in this industry into positions of power. So um, I can talk a little bit more about the coalition later, but I want to throw to Anse now. Uh, Anse has been through the fellowship program. She has been mentored. Um, and uh, Anse, I wonder if you could talk first about your career um, and how you ended up as a freelance journalist in Istanbul, and then also why you felt a need for mentorship and what mentorship has given you in your career. Yes. Thank you for the introduction. Again, my name is Ans Boersma. Um, thank you all for coming to this session. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I am working as a freelance journalist in Turkey for over a year now, and I came to um, Turkey because um, I missed working in the field. I come from a journalism university where I worked for five years, and I'm happy to see some of my former colleagues and students in the room. Um, so I come from a very stable um, environment, from a very stable job and from a very stable income every month. And I um, arrived to Turkey just before the uh, referendum last year in 2017. Um, so when I arrived I actually had no big issues uh, getting started because um, I got the job. I worked for, mainly worked for a financial newspaper in the Netherlands. I, 
uh, got the job uh, because one of my friends was working there as a journalist and he returned to the Netherlands. Um, so he gave me one big assignment already uh, when starting. So I felt quite lucky when I started that I already established some form of uh, income also, which is important. Um, but then working in Turkey for six months, um, uh, getting your own business started, uh, working on your own, uh, for me that was a big challenge because I'm not a disciplined person. Um, I hate work waking up early in the morning and having no responsibilities at all. I mean, no one would call me at 10 o'clock to ask me um, uh, where I was or why I didn't show up. So um, that was a challenge for me, but actually the bigger challenge for me was um, after six months, seven months, I felt I got stuck because uh, I had issues with editors, I had issues negotiating about not only salary, because I think um, the price in the Netherlands for an article, I'm a, I'm a writer, is still quite good, but not if you consider uh, that it's actually only uh, that, well, I, I was negotiating, um, for example, about translation costs and travel costs, this kind of stuff. Um, and I got at a point where I got very disappointed and where I was about to quit. But then I also realized I don't have a plan B. <laughs> My only plan B is, um, well, to open, we talked about it already, like, uh, what's your plan B? Well, my plan B is to open a flower shop in Istanbul. I think that would be, be great. Still thinking about it. I'm um, going to go and work with dogs. <laughs> Decided. And then I read about the Coalition for Women in Journalism, and I saw that they offered uh, mentorship um, for people in their mid-career, women in their mid-career, and with a very specific um, challenge. And I think that's also important because if you start a mentorship and you just uh, take, you just want to have a mentor for the sake of having a mentor, I mean, you can have great conversations. Um, but what I really like about the coalition is that from the start, it's very clear what your end, the end goal of the, of the process is. Um, so I reached out and then I, uh, the founder, Kiran, she, she called me and she said, ah, where are you? And then I said, I'm in Istanbul. And she said, ah, me too. And then we were actually like 100 meters away from each other. So the next day I was having a, a coffee with her and then we discussed about the challenges. Um, and it's not nice to be in a position where you sort of have to ask for help. So for me, reaching out was quite a big thing because I'm quite, I mean, um, it's, it's, it's never nice to be in a position where you feel you can't control your job anymore or you don't see any progress and you don't know where it's heading. And um, So to be in touch that fast and having someone who said like, ah, you're not the only one, that already helped me big time. Um, because I think that's what we tend to do, especially as women. And yesterday I was in a session about uh, diversity as well and um, we talked about the confidence gap, and I think that's a very big, very big problem for women. And I see it also with my, uh, with the female students that I. Is it better? Hi. Ah, Hi. Great. So my name is Ans Boersma. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you could still hear me, right, Dawa? Could you hear me? Ah, then it's then it's fine. <laughs> Um, and this confidence gap, I think, for, for, for women in journalism is already a, a big thing. And by that, I mean that I kept thinking, and I still do, that all the problems that I face with editors and uh, in the journalism field and uh, doing interviews and always explaining to men that I'm interviewing them because I'm interested in their job and not in the man himself. I mean, having that struggle on a daily basis is... Um, and still, I love my job, and I, I think it's good in my case that I uh, did it by choice, so that actually helps me uh, to keep going. Um, but then being part of the coalition um, really helped me to tackle those issues. And um, Kiran, my mentor, she is a very experienced journalist, and she uh, recognized all the issues, and she, we were very able to... Um, establish this, um, well, sort of, I'm now covering this beat and it's still, I mean, it's still going very slowly because uh, I'm quite impatient also. I want to see direct results. Um, but one of the things she helped me to 
to understand what was like, what is your responsibility as a freelancer? And what's basically the responsibility of editors you work with or newsrooms you work with? And we will discuss this further also, like um, what are the specific challenges for freelance journalists also working uh, outside, in my case, the Netherlands. So you don't really have this contact with a newsroom only by email. So that's, you need to establish relationships with uh, editors while being like far away from them, which is, which is quite a challenge, I think. Um, but we will definitely uh, discuss that. But being part of the coalition, it really helped me to, to overcome some of my struggles, not all of them yet. Um, but also to, to see like what's my responsibility. So my responsibility is to show up at work, even though I have to, I don't have to show up at work, uh, like early in the morning and, and make my hours and, and not only focus on the outcome, but also like seeing the progress in this. So that's one of the things that I got out of the um, coalition. I think, I think you were, um, is this on? Can you hear me? Uh, I think you were very lucky, actually, to uh, to be paired with the founder of this this initiative, and uh, it's it's great to, to 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 see the fruits of both of your labour. Um, I wanted I wanted to talk about why it's difficult to ask for help, and why it's difficult to, I think, maybe maybe not just for women, uh, but in in this business. Uh, why solidarity is important, but why it might seem antithetical to some. And I'm, I'm thinking of a, of a tension I want to ask if you feel uh, between the need to compete with your peers who are covering the same beats and, and you know, all of us who were, uh, went through the drill in journalism school have, have been told that you know, competition is our lifeblood of this, of this industry and we are supposed to compete with each other. How do you balance that alongside the need for solidarity in what can be quite an isolating career. Yeah, I think talking about, uh, well, your question about why it's difficult to ask for help, I think there is this sort of journal journalist identity. So if, I mean, it's changing, but I think that as journalists, you, you, you are quite confident, and I'm quite a confident person, but then still you have all these issues going on. Uh, so to, as a journalist to ask for help, I think that sorts of, I mean, it's, it's not really in the industry, I think. And then um, about the competition part, well, all my Dutch colleagues in Istanbul are males, so I don't know, I don't, they, 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 most of them, they still have a contract, I think, but they, I'm not sure if they work as a freelancer. And then... All other journalists for me are not really competition because I, I basically work for Dutch media and I think um, we're with six journalists from the Netherlands in Turkey at the moment. So I think, I mean, Turkey is still very important for the Netherlands. Uh, so for me, the competition is not a big thing because I, I connect with international journalists and for example, my colleague from the German Handelsblatt, which is the financial newspaper of uh, Germany, is actually someone I really work together with because we, we're not competition and uh, we also cover the same field. So actually that benefits us both. Um, but I hear it from other, from other colleagues who are in other countries, uh, for example, in um, the southern part of Africa where you have this uh, bubble of Dutch journalists who are all competing. So I think for them it's, that's a bigger issue. Um, but then at the same time, I don't really believe, I, 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 for me, personally, I believe in uh, cooperation, especially in 2018. I mean, if you work together with people and you are able to um, do things together, I, th I really think that, especially in a country like Turkey, that you, you can establish better, uh, better coverage of the country. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, your work in, in Turkey. Uh, we've heard a lot at this festival about the situation for journalists in Turkey. It's not good. Uh, and I remember we were, were speaking before this panel about why it's important for you to be part of international networks as a freelancer mm -hmm. in an insecure uh, reporting situation. Um, do, you, do you want to talk about, I think what you said to me was, um, no one, if, I go, if I get put in jail, no one's going to notice when I don't go to the office, yeah. if the office is your spare bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> 
I sort of joked about it. I said if I end up in jail, no one will notice for maybe three weeks. I um, promise I will <laughs> notice if you go to jail. <laughs> which is, of course, not true because I have a lovely support network around me. Uh, but actually, it's, it's, I joke about it, but it's quite serious when you look at... Um, well, when, when I talk about my... like the connections with newsrooms I have, because I think there is this trend of sending... It's very nice as a newsroom to have a correspondent in Turkey at the moment. And not only Turkey, but China, Russia, I mean, all those countries. It's great if you have a reporter there. But then we, we in 2008, I think nowadays it's, it's quite common to have freelancers, um, which can be a very good thing, I think, because um, as a freelancer, you, I mean, I feel free also, which is very nice. That's the best part of my job. Um, but I don't think that working with freelancers also means that as a newsroom you don't have any responsibility for the people that are working for you. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, that's one of the reasons why the coalition is important and maybe you can talk about this example a bit more about India where uh, the coalition actually helped by getting someone out of prison also and I think this is, it's important as uh, female journalist, I think, also to to establish as a, as a freelancer, you have the responsibility to take care of yourself. So reaching out to the coalition for me is also bridging this gap between having no support professionally. Not I'm not talking about my private life, but uh, on a professional level, and then um, well supporting each other as female journalists worldwide, which of course is a big. It's very big, but I also feel I'm, I'm part of WhatsApp groups and on Facebook. We have a very active community. Um, and the coalition is really able to, to give this kind of support also. Yeah, I think one of the great revelations of 2018 for me has been the power of the WhatsApp group. Uh, and if you're not in a WhatsApp group with other female journalists, just get in one. They are great <laughs> for mental health, for solidarity, for making us better at their jobs. Um, I wanted to talk about the role of the editor, though, um, because I am an editor who commissions freelance journalists, and I, this is a relationship that I think a lot about, because I think there is a, a, la a, a large power imbalance in this relationship. Uh, I have more power than the freelancer who is writing for me, and I think a lot, and I don't have answers, sorry, uh, that was another sorry. I do not have answers about how we can create a relationship that is honest, that is open, that is supportive of women working in often insecure conditions. And I think a big part of that is this idea that as a freelancer, you just get the job done. And you get it done on time, on deadline, to the word count, you don't complain, you don't send it in late, and you don't make excuses. Uh, and, you know, that's lovely, <laughs> and I like it when pieces come in on time, obviously. But I think that that expectation can mean that it is hard to ask for help, it is hard to say when something can't be done, and we can push ourselves into situations that are not safe or that we're not comfortable in because of this expectation that journalists have to be bulletproof, and if they're not, then they won't get any more work. Uh, so that's certainly not a relationship I ever want to cultivate. I don't think it's a healthy one. Um, and I'd be very interested to speaking to, to anyone after the session about how we can have more honest, caring, open, useful relationships between freelancers and editors uh, that are based on trust and are based on empathy. Uh, but I guess I wanted to ask you, uh, as a freelancer, what do you find that you need from editors? that perhaps sometimes that you don't get, and please don't say answer your emails, because I promise I really try. <laughs> so answer your emails. Oh. <laughs> no, it's not that. I think for me there is a difference in, you're talking about getting the job done, but for me I think the first part is getting the assignment. That's already a big thing. Um, for me there is a difference between, um, as a freelancer, between the, the, the newsrooms I work with on a regular basis and the, the newsrooms that I pitch a story and the actually people that don't know me and um, I, I mean we talked about this and I can imagine that as an editor that you get a lot of emails every day and then it's very hard to answer all these emails and to be a nice person and everything but then in that case I think it's still important that as editors that you have a sort of that freelancers know that how you would like it to be done because we actually don't know, and many times we, we don't. We are not part of the newsrooms, so 
for me, it was very hard um, to understand all the cultures of all the different newsrooms. And all the, the, all the newsrooms, they have their own language. And I think also there is already a big problem because sending a pitch, but also uh, in contact with editors, um, someone gave me the advice to man up, speak the language of men, and then you will be, I'm not a man, <laughs> I'm a woman, I'm not going to man up. So I have my own way of, I have a different way to communicate maybe, it's not more, it's not less, it's not better, it's not worse, it's different. So don't expect me as a freelancer to understand I once asked an editor, like, why don't you reply my email? Or he said, if I don't want it, I don't answer. So it's good to know that, I mean, because being ignored is, is not nice. Um, but then if I know that if it's not good enough, then I don't get an answer, then for me at least I have an explanation. But many times I have no idea um, what newsrooms expect. So I think as editors, if you want to make your own work easier also, I think having a very clear instruction, I, I worked in a university before and I would get sometimes 100 emails from students. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but then, um, yeah, I, I mean, people take the effort to, and I, as I, don't, I think editors don't really, not always understand uh, how long it took to send the email and how much work is in that, maybe even five lines. Um, and that you also, not getting an answer, also sometimes you already have interviews ready, so you have a sort of pressure also, and when something is happening now, if it's a newsy article, you really want a response from an editor, and even if it's a no, then just send the no. Um, yeah, but I also understand, of course, that, that uh, as an editor you get a lot of emails in, but... I want to yeah. come to this idea of manning up. Uh, <laughs> which is certainly something that I've been told to do in my career as well, and I don't know that there are many women who do what we do who haven't been t told some version of this is a newsroom, this is what it's like, it's tough, you just have to deal with it, um, you need to express yourself differently to get what you want. Um, not useful advice. Don't, if, if you come away with this from the session thinking one thing, it's, you know, never tell someone to man up, uh, or any, any variation thereof. Uh, but I think this speaks to a need uh, as journalists to, A, as women journalists, as you say, not feel the need to replicate toxic practices that have come from what is a very, uh, I guess, patriarchal system uh, of the way our industry was built. Um, we, I shy away from this idea that women are particularly... Um, different from men in that we're, you know, more emotional and fluffier and inherently <laughs> different. I don't think that's true. But we have been socialized to communicate in a different way. Uh, and the way that journalists have been taught to communicate with each other, I think, um, in the past has been very toxic. So we need to start having different conversations. We need to start talking to each other using different language. And we need to, I think, as editors, be more open to pitches, to conversations, to dealings uh, with freelancers and with our colleagues that do not conform to it, to the kind of script of, um, of manning up, as it were. Uh, and, th and that does mean probably not ignoring things that don't conform to the pitch formula that you're used to um, and, and understanding that different people have different ways of, of communicating and there might be all types of different reasons for that. Yeah, and I think in addition that I don't know, speaking for myself, I take it very personal if I don't get, so, so what you do is like, ah, probably there's something wrong, and then you don't get a response, and then you're like, ah, so probably there's something wrong with my work, and then that's a, we talked about this before, and I said, what happens is that you, you go back to your comfort zone, so I tend to go to, you know, I have some editors that I love to work with, they pay shit, so they are the ones who ask me like, how are you, and how's Turkey today, and I, I really like that, and they, get, they give feedback, so actually I learn a lot from them, but in the end of the month, I mean, there's, there's not a big result. So I think if you want to break through this, I mean, um, the, the bigger assignments, and um, uh, maybe also people, uh, men and women, I, I, not all editors are, are men, thank God. Hashtag not uh, all editors. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it's um, I think then it's important that you, you just, you need to continue and you need to, I mean, then just ask for it, like how do you want it, or just give them a short call, but 
somehow you need to tackle this issue for sure because otherwise it won't get you well I will go back to my comfort zone and I will or maybe open the flower shop I don't know <laughs> no this whole session is to prevent you opening a flower yeah. shop um, I, I think that, that there's really something in there about the the dual roles that that women in newsrooms have uh, and it's all outside of newsrooms. You have to be doing the best that you can always for your career, as any journalist needs to. Some of us feel pressure to do to be representatives of women <laughs> and show that women can do things as well as men uh, or be role models for young women coming through uh, and never make mistakes. Uh, I, I feel that pressure, and I, I know a lot of women journalists I speak to do as well. Uh, and always second-guessing, uh, did I not get that because I'm a woman? Or did I not argue hard enough because I'm a woman? Or did I not negotiate hard enough because I'm a woman? Or am I getting paid less because I'm a woman? And how can I find that out? And even if none of that is happening, this is a narrative that goes through our heads because this is the world that we live in. Uh, and that, I think that that takes an emotional uh, toll, uh, leads to, can lead to a sense of emotional exhaustion. Uh, and that's, again, why I think having conversations like this as deeply uncomfortable as they are mm -hmm. uh, is so important because it's this sense that we're not alone, uh, we're not the only people having these thoughts, meeting these challenges. Uh, but, here is the big but, uh, this is where I say that there are not nearly enough men in this room. Uh, I can see a few. I personally know two of them, so I'm sorry you two don't count. You had to be here. Uh, this, is a <laughs> this is a conversation that and women... Know the other yeah, <laughs> We've been having these conversations through Whisper Networks yeah. for decades, for centuries. And it's been great these past nine months to see this conversation happening on a global scale. But we really need men to get involved in this, not be afraid to get involved in this, start talking about how they can help, start being transparent about how much they get paid, uh, particularly, I think, freelancers, so, we, so freelancers can know when there's room to ask for more. Uh, yeah, these conversations are important, but I'm sort of sick of talking to women about them all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's not only, I think we, we should stop talking and start acting, but it's not about women in journalism, it's also in the Netherlands, uh, we have a diversity uh, um, discussion going on, and talking to people from another cultural background, uh, I have the same sort of conversation, and then being uh, women with a different cultural background is, is even harder. Um, and I think the problem is that that we need to tackle this this culture at the at the in the newsroom issue because y we still expect everyone to fit in the model that we created and and we, if we don't change this model and I remember I, I attended a, a panel a year ago I think it was in the Netherlands and I there was an an, an older woman talking and I. When she finished, I said, if I close my eyes, it's like I hear a man talking because she was like, yeah, but women, you know, they stay home because they have kids and sometimes when they, when I don't even have kids yet, I can't even imagine how that will be, uh, being a freelance journalist. Um, and that's something that I hear a lot, that um, I have a friend who has a Moroccan background and he, he studied law and he was invited to this meeting of a bank where they introduced their diversity network and everything. Um, and he said they had um, a guy with a, with, a Dutch, with a Moroccan background and he was talking, but he said he was, it was like I, I heard someone speaking from the east of the Netherlands, girl, you know, this farmer kid, because he really adapted to the language of this whole bank and I think People leave, like not only women, but also people from another cultural um, um, background, because they don't feel comfortable in this in this culture. So if you don't change the culture, uh, I mean, people will go away because they don't feel accepted or they feel different all the time. And I think in new initiatives, I, I think it's very important that you don't talk about diversity, but that you just start off with um, with a very diverse. Uh, group of people and not because you want to have this excuse uh, uh, woman or excuse Moroccan in your group but just be because of their profession because they are there if you if you see who's graduating from universities all over the world I mean it's a mixed group of people so why they don't end up uh, I mean it's not that the 
that it's not available. So I think we, we really need to work on this, tackle this cultural issue also. I think you're exactly right. And I want to now uh, move to some questions because I think Me Too is, if anything, a conversation. Uh, and I want to open that up, that conversation up to the floor. Uh, anyone who wants to talk about any of the issues that we've brought up today, um, I'd be very happy to hear from you. Uh, just with the slight proviso that uh, specific questions about the, the minutiae of the Coalition for Women in Journalism, come see me afterwards and I'll, I'll connect you with the, with the right people. As I said, I am a stand-in on that, on that matter. Uh, but does anyone have a question that they would like to ask? Do we have microphones? in the front, if we can pass that down. Hi, um, I was wondering, there's quite a bit of sociological studies that also demonstrate that women tend to be harsher to women. Um, and I was wondering if you... I was wondering if you... <laughs> Have I come up? Oh. I've come, come across this microphone being nasty to me. Uh, have I come across women being their own worst enemy, tearing each other down, women being um, toxic to other women? Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I don't know the sociological studies you speak of. Uh, I, don't, I don't have that experience. Um, my experience is usually uh, like the conversation that I had with aunts over lunch yesterday going, oh my God, it's not just me. Oh, that happened to you too. Oh God, it is, it is, these are conversations of solidarity. Uh, and I, I, how do I put this? I would say that problems in the most I'm picking my words very carefully. I would say that difficulties and challenges I've had in my career and that I've seen in the careers of my female peers and colleagues, the problems, the majority of the problems do not tend to come from women. No, I, I, I see where your question comes from because I think in the past that was maybe um, more visible, but I don't experience it. I come, the university where I worked, I think my colleague is there, Caroline. I hope she will have a question also. Um, but in my former job, I experienced that working together with another female in this case, that, that really helped me to tackle issues. And I think you can only benefit from getting together and, and tackling the things that you're facing or just doing the job. Because that's also, I mean, we're talking about this and we experience this, but. I have a job to do also, so I actually don't want to be on these kind of panels anymore. I just want to do my job. I have a lot of work in Turkey. So uh, consider that also you talked about the emotional toll, but I think, um, and that's why it's good to work with other women because it can only improve you. I think we can only get better of, you know, working together, yeah. We have a question here about midway through. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Vincenzia, and I'm from Tanzania. And one of the, well, my current initiative is Media Lab, where we nurture young journalists uh, so that they can report stories that will trigger accountability in Tanzania. And um, we also have um, a challenge of getting women in media, like uniting or working together. So I was wondering, um, whether we can be part of the coalition, or are there any other opportunities where uh, we can engage these women, uh, women reporters or journalists from Tanzania and any other um, coalition or um, uh, opportunities there are for collaboration or uh, mentorship, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Okay, A, uh, send me your young journalists, I want them to write for me, uh, and B, come and talk to me afterwards about other ways we can collaborate. That sounds Thank great. Thank you so much. Where else? I think I had one there, and then we'll go there. Oh, sorry, can we go here first, and then over? Thanks. <laughs> sorry, dude. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Karis. I'm a freelancer. I also do some work 
um, with women's economic advancement deeply. Um, and I wanted to go back to the question about sort of this idea of manning up in the professional world, because I don't always know if that's really a choice that we have, because mm -hmm. it comes down to um, you have to somehow fit into the environment that you're working within, or you it's either you give up a professional opportunity by saying, well, I, I don't, I'm not the right culture fit myself. I know I just had an interview uh, this week that was completely thrown off because the pace was just extremely aggressive and something I did not expect and I don't think I did as well in the interview because I was just so thrown off by this pace. And so I was very torn because I said, well, I don't really know if I'd want to work in this environment, but at the same time, maybe they should have people who are not <laughs> like that working in this environment. So um, I guess, you know, if there's, I don't know if either of you have any tips about sort of how to assert a less assertive personality um, or how to sort of navigate that being less, um, sort of being maybe the odd one out in this environment that asks you to man up, how do you kind of assert, assert that? Well, I think it's lose-lose. I'm sorry. I think it's lose-lose because if you don't man up, then you're a useless, fluffy woman who can't get it done. And if you do man up, then you're an arrogant, pushy <coughs> B-word uh, who asks for too much. So, uh, sorry, that's a very negative answer to your question, but the, I guess the positive answer that comes out of that is give yourself a break because you can't win uh, and just represent yourself in the most authentic way uh, and in the meantime, you know, the rest of us are really working hard to bring down this patriarchy. Ugh. <laughs> and yeah, but I think I think you summarized the whole the whole issue there. And and um, yesterday in this session about diversity, they said that um, talking to editors that they say we just want who is the best for the job. Um, but I think that that who is the best for the job from your perspective is a very biased thing. Um, and as an editor, you want someone who will get the job done. And when I do a job interview, I have my insecurities. And even though I know how to, uh, because I'm, I'm a bit older now, and I mean, 10 years ago, I was more insecure. So you, you have this conversation with someone who is this, you know, uh, who's, who's quite harsh. And, and uh, they want to see if you will be able to do the job. Well, the answer is no, because you will never fit to their um, to their expectations. Uh, so, and I know it will cost me assignments in the future also, because I will not be the, the person that they look for. So then, well, just go to places where you uh, feel comfortable for now. Um, but also, uh, I had to tackle, I hate to, to call people. So, but being a journalist and not picking up your phone and stuff, that's, that's a big thing. So you have to overcome. So. There are also things that you can do to actually be able to have a conversation in a professional way. And don't be afraid to confront people also with their, I mean, you can give the feedback even if you don't end up, uh, stand up for yourself. And come to Turkey because in Turkey you really learn how to stand up for yourself, <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I, I wanna just come back. I, the answer to that question obviously is for the person who interviewed you to be better at their job. Uh, so again, this, this goes to, those of us who are in positions of power, those of us who are, have full-time jobs in newsrooms, let's make those newsrooms as inclusive uh, and accepting and as open-minded as we possibly can. That's the, the very least we can do. Uh, we have a question over here. Oh, <laughs> over there. No, you were next, no? Yeah, he were. Yeah. Oh, so to, uh, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> My question actually was about uh, biases and uh, entitlement, I think, uh, besides the whole me too and unfair stuff that's out there, there's also this sense of entitlement uh, that I might have being a white male walking into a room thinking, I, I own this room or something. Isn't it then, uh, if you only have groups of women coaching other women or talking about their problems amongst women or, uh, or having a, a woman mentor, I understand it because they have the same problems, but isn't getting a, uh, getting men involved or also having this sense of entitlement or something? If you don't pick up your phone, so you want to be a mentor? No, no, I, <laughs> not necessarily. But isn't that perspective also interesting? Yeah. It is. Uh, the Coalition for Women in Journalism is not the answer to all of the problems of women in journalism, uh, but it is an acknowledgement of the fact that women have experiences to share with other women that can be helpful in helping us advance our careers. But you're absolutely right. We need men to do more. We need men involved in the conversation. 
Uh, and I, yeah, I should probably show you this bit of the website, which is all of the lovely men who help with the coalition. Yeah. So they exist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I think the conversation is changing also because I see it with with young journalists. I think it, it's it's a more it's a, it's it became a normal conversation. So I'm very hopeful, but with the traditional newsrooms and agencies, I think there's still a big problem. Yeah, but new initiatives you, you see it right here. Uh, I mean, all the new initiatives they are very diverse. Most of them are very diverse. So, yeah. Let's go to the back. Hello, uh, my name's Rebecca and I work for a local newspaper in the UK. Uh, firstly, I wanted to say what's quite nice is actually it's run by a really small staff. It's just me and one other girl that's my age. Uh, but what's quite funny is that when members of the public come in and see that a whole newspaper is made by just two like twen early 20-year-old girls, their reaction is a bit like, oh, I wasn't expecting that, so that's quite funny. Uh, but what I wanted to say was how can we try and get more men involved because every time I bring up an issue even just with my male peers like for example the gender pay disparity they just shrug it off like they're not interested it doesn't affect me um, and it's quite frustrating because I don't think they mean to do it um, they say oh that's not an issue so I just wanted to kind of wonder how we could go about trying to encourage the conversation to everybody yeah, well, that's a good question, um, and um, I think that not, I mean, if I talk to other women in journalism, not all of them are experiencing the same problems and some just don't want to think about it, um, but I think it's important to make make it as small as we, you need to be able to, to explain why it's also relevant for them. I think that's very important, um, but I... In another way, I experienced the same problem because at the beginning of the year, uh, I work as a financial journalist and I found out that I interviewed more, way more men than uh, women in 2017. So I set myself a goal that this year I will do it the other way around. But then if I, try to, if I reach out to women, many times they say, ah, but I don't feel comfortable talking about this or I don't, I don't, I am, I'm, I'm not that, I don't have the expertise yet or call me back in three months. But I think there we have a responsibility as, as women. I think that's also why it's important already in journalism schools to talk about these issues and show the relevance also for the industry, but also on their individual lives, yeah. Um, okay, do you go to the person next to you who also had their hand up. Hi, I'm Fleur and I'm a former student of uh, ANS, Yay. so go ANS! Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering, we're talking about conversations and WhatsApp groups and supporting each other, but um, how do you move on from talking about this topic and um, raising awareness to including um, female journalism um, within the whole journalistic world? Like, um, how do you make it normal? and? make it so that you don't even have to talk about it anymore? What are the steps that you have to take in order to accomplish that? I would love to stop having this conversation. <laughs> uh, how do we... Hmm. Yeah, if we had the answer, then it would be done, right? Yeah, yeah, but what I said, like mentorship is talking about it, but it's, it's also very um, uh, practical. So going from talking about it to going to individual female journalists to tackle their issues, I mean, that helped me. So by now, I am actually not talking about it only, but I'm also doing it. So that's that's part of it. And I think the industry changed already big time. So hopefully in, in how many years? 10? <laughs> in right. 10 years, we don't have to talk about it anymore. That's the deadline, everyone. See you here in 2028. <laughs> It'll be fixed. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I want to interject to say I have heard from Kieran who's watching, which makes me feel very nervous. Uh, and she says that he, the he for she part of the um, coalition is open for applications from men who want to help. So men in the room, there's your homework. I think we have time for one more and I see a hand there. Let's have two more. We have 15 minutes left, right? No, no. no. Oh, we have 15 minutes yeah. left. Yeah, sure. Sorry, we have time for lots more. <laughs> I hope you have more questions. Thank you very much. My name is Solange. Uh, I work with Pax Press. It's a local NGO of journalists in Rwanda. Um, uh, I have a comment and one question. 
Um, my comment is uh, uh, about sexual harassment. Uh, uh, I'm a trainer of International Women Media Foundation mm -hmm. uh, in Rwanda, and I was reported that some interns are facing a problem of sexual harassment because nowadays the employment uh, is a big uh, problem to access, so that the uh, female journalists start and the other journalists start by uh, internship, then among the internees, the media houses, they choose uh, the some staff. So uh, I was reported that interns are facing a problem of sexual harassment, uh, and uh, one of the challenge they face is the lack of of proof. Even when they started to talk about this, and the report, the, the testimony was given by a, a male editor who reported this to me. When they talk to, when they start to talk about this, they are they are fired or they are they are not promoted. So um, my question is how how to how to to fight against this this uh, issue and how to to teach to girls or to ladies how to preserve the, the proof. Because when someone harassed you verbally, there's no proof. You cannot record him. When someone touch you, you are too. Sometimes there's no proof. So, and you become like, uh, instead of being a victim, you are seen as um, a disorder, someone who bring, uh, so you see. So this is a big challenge, not only for interns, but for also female journalist in general. Uh, my, uh, and, uh, also another question is about how you collaborate. I, I know I can go and read on your we website, but I need to, to the, in the internet here is not very good. <laughs> I need to know more. You collaborate with individuals or you collaborate with umbrellas? So, uh, b because if it's a, the, the being a member, uh, it's an individual, or if it's a group, for me, I think collaborating with umbrellas or organization of women journalists is also better. So uh, for to capacitate, to, to pass through those umbrella, so to access to many, many uh, female journalists and especially young journalists. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, your story about sexual harassment absolutely breaks my heart. Uh, I hate, I hate hearing about this, um, and I wish, I wish this didn't still happen. And it still happens so much. It's happened to me. It's happened to so many people I know. Oh, God, and I, I, I'm always wary of putting the solution to these problems onto women who have already been through more than they should ever have to. The idea that we should have to go around recording conversations we have in case we get harassed uh, is just horrific. And I think the answer is, the broad answer is to build a culture of believing women who have been harassed, who have been abused. Uh, we have so much work to do on that. We are so far from where we need to be on that. Um, I don't know if you have anything more. Yeah, useful. I think that's a, that's a big that, that's a very it's a very relevant um, question that you raise because I think that's something that even I mean as a coalition you can't solve these issues you can talk about it and of course there's a lot of support and um, coalition can connect you to people but in the end it's also about are you living in a in a country with a strong civil society and and uh, are you able to reach out to um, institutions that will defend you and how is the how is the law and I mean those are for the Netherlands I know this is this is arranged but then I know that there are many countries and many many journalists in country working in countries where you have absolutely no uh, place to go so um, yeah I don't have an answer also and um, it's good to keep talking but then yeah in the end uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I. I. I would. I would add to that that even in countries with strong um, anti-discrimination laws, mm. uh, criminal protection from sexual abuse and harassment, and I. I do know uh, that Rwanda has very robust laws around gender, uh, but that is certainly no guarantee of women's safety, and it's no guarantee that women will be believed, and we see that every single day. 
Um, I do think that um, while we can't stop, um, well, we can eventually stop men harassing women, uh, but in, in a case like this, um, all we can provide as women, and it is a lot, is, is solidarity and career support to go somewhere else. Uh, and so if there is any way I can help, please come and see me afterwards. Uh, but also, we, those of us who have full-time positions in news organisations have to be thinking all of the time about how we can help and support women in more precarious situations so that they don't have to put up with things like that. And also, if they do not feel strong enough to go through a sexual harassment case in a workplace, which is brutal, and uh, not everybody has time or energy or emotional resilience to do, I think providing other options and building um, newsrooms that are better places for women to work is, is sort of the ultimate goal and doing in the meantime as much as we can to make sure that women don't have to be in a situation when they are facing harassment um, is, the, is the best we can do. Uh, in terms of how we collaborate, uh, I have a slide um, and this is really for everyone. Um, if you want to collaborate with the coalition, is that, oh no. It's there? Okay. Uh, if you want to collaborate with the coalition, the, the email address is mentors at womenandjournalism.org. Um, in terms of accepting fellows, this happens twice a year in July and January. It's a 20-day window each time. Uh, so please keep an eye out for, for calls um, if you are interested in being mentored. Uh, and if you are interested in being a mentor or collaborating in another way, then, then please uh, send that yeah, emails to that address uh, and certainly come and see me and Ants after the, after the session. In the back. Um, just a, a quick follow-up to the remarks on sexual harassment in Rwanda. Uh, I'm a former colleague, by the way, full disclosure of Anz, and uh, uh, proud to be your best friend and very supportive of the network. I think one of the things that is, is very important as far as harassment is concerned is uh, at university we, we teach a culture of uh, doing these sort of uh, empowerment issues together, so the he for she part of the campaign, I think, and the, the project that you do is very important because, as said, any sort of harassment is only uh, to be uh, countered in a way if you do it together, so if, if uh, men and women work together, uh, especially because still a lot of the people in charge, uh, so in the, in the positions in power, uh, are men and they're not bad in itself. Uh, but they do have more power than they think, and they, they also have more power to change sort of the structural dynamic that is going on, which is difficult for a women's coalition or any sort of supportive network whatsoever uh, to do. So, so with all admiration and all uh, uh, applaud for, for the work that you guys do, I think that structural dynamic and the sort of uh, work that men and women in journalism can do together, I think that is very important to discuss also. So sort of the structural context uh, surrounding it. Especially uh, because as you uh, said, Megan, um, you don't want to be put into a situation as a female journalist to record anything and everything that you do and to have like a big brother watching, or big sister, uh, watching every move you, you do to, to sort of monitor all the interactions that you have with male colleagues. I mean, that would be like ridiculous um, uh, to, to, to have that burden uh, put upon you aside from all the other burdens that we already have. So I think that this part is very important of the work that you do. Yeah. So. Thank you. Over here maybe and then down. Oh, sorry, you've been waiting for ages. Sorry, let's go here. <laughs> So I'm Viola and I'm a journalism student, uh, so I don't really apply uh, in the category of uh, middle uh, career uh, journalist that you usually work with, but I was wondering, uh, do you feel like uh, if uh, we started uh, having uh, uh, gender-focused uh, uh, training sessions uh, to journalism students, uh, like many of the problems could be prevented? I think there's, a, in 
journalism school, I think it's important to already talk about uh, these issues and also um, make sure that women, I mean, you're not in your mid-career yet, but still you go to internships, so you are faced with the same challenges, uh, as you also mentioned already. Um, so I think it's good to, to have, I don't know what about your university, but in the universe I used to work with, that's basically my only female colleague. Um, so how you will learn about these issues if you only have um, male uh, professors who are uh, over, well, 45 maybe. Um, so, yeah, I think it's important to start it in journalism school as well and that to, to be resilient to what's coming, sort of, instead of what you said already before, uh, get used to it, this is the industry, and this is because that's an old fashioned, so never accept this sort of image of the industry. So tackle that and uh, tell them that that's not how it, how the future will be. So be future minded and don't accept this old way of thinking from no one. Yeah. Yeah, I really agree. Uh, and I, if that's something that you think um, would benefit your university, tell people. I, you know, I, I wish I'd been taught this stuff at university, and, and I, you know, and I wish I'd spoken up and said I need training on this. So I think I think you should do that if you feel comfortable. <laughs> okay, we had someone over here. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I'm relatively new to journalism. I've been freelancing for about two years, and prior to my time working uh, in this field, I was a community organizer. And so what I'm hearing a lot is this kind of sense of like, there's a real need to build power to actually change the situation instead of decrying the same issues over and over again. Um, and so something I'm interested in also is kind of broadening the conversation around inc inclusion. It's not just about women, it's also about uh, people of color, uh, sexual minorities, et cetera. And so something I'm curious to know if it exists or not, has anyone done work to kind of collect best practices from women-led or people of color-led newsrooms to then be able to actually train other newsrooms in what those practices might be uh, for those that are actually interested? Because I think it's easy to say it shouldn't be like this, but to actually develop a model for how to transition into a different practice mm -hmm. is something else. And so if you know of initiatives like that, I would love to hear about them, and I'm sure others would be interested too. Thank you. I don't know about these models. I'm sure that, because I'm not, I'm not in newsrooms, so maybe you know this better. Um, I know that many newsrooms in the Netherlands try to implement a model, but I'm not sure if that was coming from one initiative. No. Um, I, no, I we, we heard about some of these initiatives in an earlier panel um, on diversity. Um, Doug Mitchell does great work on this. He is here. I was really blown away by what he does. Um, but yeah, I, I would also love to, to hear, hear more about that. So if anyone uh, in the crowd knows of anything that you think should be highlighted, please stick your hand up or find our friend over here later. Anyone else? Okay, we've solved the problem. Well done, everyone. Uh, okay, I think, I, I think we, we, we should wrap up here. Um, I have a couple more points I'd like to make in, in conclusion. I want to ask Anse if there's anything you want to conclude with. Yeah, well, as I said before, I just hope that I can, I can focus on my work and that all the other uh, uh, journalists out there can only focus on the very important work that needs to be done all around the world in journalism. So, uh, so in, in closing, I, I want to remind everybody about this email address. Um, and if you want to support the coalition, if you want to be part of the coalition, please, um, it's a, a remarkable thing to be part of. I couldn't recommend it more. Uh, and it's only growing. So, so please, uh, please stick your hand up and come and talk to me afterwards. Uh, but I, I do want to make this point that, that mentoring is so important um, in our business, in a lot of businesses, and it, it feel, fills a gap uh, that has long been there. Um, but, you know, these issues that women journalists face, these issues that women in the workforce face, these are structural problems. Uh, and some are to do with kind of what's happening to our industry at the moment. Some of them are to do with the status of women in society. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully bodies like the coalition can really make a significant dent in this problem and, and, and push women through so that finally we are seeing 
enough women, enough people of color, enough sexual minorities in positions of power, making decisions that matter, and being role models for people formally, not uh, needing uh, mentorship because our newsrooms look the way they should, are as diverse as they should be, and we can all see them as a place where we fit in. Uh, and that's a much bigger project. So I really hope that we can all keep work working towards that, making space for others where we can, supporting women where we can, and fundamentally changing this business because it will only get better the more diverse we are, the more women are in positions of power, and the less we have to deal with the kind of issues that we've heard about today. Um, that's all from me. Thank you again to Kiran, uh, who's been WhatsApping me, <laughs> uh, answers to your questions and in general encouragement. Uh, and um, if anyone has any questions, we are, we are here afterwards. Thank you very much.